So today we continue our series on Jonah. We are going to be wrapping up. We've been looking at this series for the last three weeks, and to, today is our last uh, uh, chapter, which is chapter four, and this is titled Furious Rage and God's Grace. Furious Rage and God's Grace. So last week we saw how Jonah obeyed when God's word came for the second time in uh, chapter 3 verse 1. Because the first time God's word came to Jonah in chapter 1, Jonah had run away from God, right? And here Jonah, uh, when, jo when, when Jonah responded to God's word for the second time, we saw that Nineveh actually turned from their wicked ways, from their uh, ways, and so after Jonah's preaching, right, the people of Nineveh had shown signs of repentance, including the king. And at this moment in time, you would think that Jonah would be rejoicing because isn't that what uh, a believer is to be doing when somebody or the nation, a nation repents, right? Because that great city had repented. But chapter 4 now shows us that that is not what happened. Jonah did not rejoice. First one actually says that Jonah was very angry, right? So the question here is, why was Jonah angry? And what does our anger tell us about our understanding of God's grace? So why was Jonah angry? What does our anger tell us about our understanding of God's grace? To understand that, to, to answer that, we're going to see the root of self-righteous anger. The root of self-righteous anger. Number two, we'll see the lesson of grace under the shade. The lesson of grace under the shade. Thirdly, we'll see the grace God extends to outsiders. The grace God extends to outsiders. So number one, the root of self-righteous anger. <clears throat> but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry, and he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Right? Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord says, Do you do well to be angry? Now, before we move into the story, notice it says, verse 1, but it displeased the Lord. Nineveh had repented, but, that is the turning point, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was angry. Uh, remember that Jonah's hatred for the Assyrians, who were Israel's enemies, was so great that he even resented God's character. He prayed and says, oh Lord, uh, it's not this what I said when I was yet in my country. So this conversation had started when he left his country, when God's word came, right? He says, that is why I made haste to run. That is why I took a ship to Tarshish. You see, Jonah's heart is now open and laid bare. Jonah confesses openly before God. You see, Jonah loved being a Hebrew, right? Notice that word, I, uh, the word country. Because he says, you know, this is what I said when I was yet in my country. Jonah loved being a Hebrew as any other Israelite. Uh, a chosen people of God. They prided themselves, the Jews, right? As the chosen people of God. Israel as a nation is special. A, a royal priesthood. That was the mindset. He loved his country. But he hated Nineveh. He hated the Assyrians. See, love for your country and national identity is a good thing. Right? There is this healthy love for country and national identity. But making an idol of a national identity can bring a sense of superiority. Right? Or make us contemptuous of other people. People with other political leanings. Right? Extreme nationalism can turn into racism and even lead to fascism. Uh, we don't have time to point out history to look into that. So what was Jonah's real reason for, uh, for running from God? Right here, he says, For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. This was Jonah's problem, right? This was a deeper problem. 
Jonah knew that Yahweh, which is Israel's God, is gracious and merciful. Jonah's words here echo Exodus 34, 6, which says, The Lord God is a merciful and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, that He is a God who keeps covenant, that He is faithful. But for Jonah, he thought this was for Israel only. Right? He resented the fact that a Gentile, horrible, cruel nation like the Assyrians who were in Nineveh had shown signs of repentance. Jonah does not understand God's grace at the heart level. See, This is what happens, right? As believers, we know in our heads that God is gracious and merciful. But is that the functional reality of our hearts, right? It's because if Jonah knew that Israel's God is gracious and slow to anger, why did it anger him greatly? <laughs> because in Jonah's mind, the Assyrians were a terrorist state. Now, to be fair, right? In his mind, they deserve only judgment, not mercy. See? Does this sound familiar? Because I know, I know for a fact, right? Many believers, including me, know in our heads that God is gracious and merciful. Of course we know that. There is a measure of uh, uh, God's grace and mercy that we have tasted. That's why we are here at church gathering, right? There is this appreciation. But, right, what happens when uh, our... Uh, what happens when we are offended? <laughs> See, we sing of His grace and love for us and we read about it in the Bible. Like Jonah who cried in distress in chapter 2, we ask God grace in times of trouble. Jonah was delivered. But why is he angry? Why are we quick to anger if we know that God is slow to anger? Wow. Right? Why are we quick to anger and slow to offer grace? See, Jonah was basically saying, I know that you are a gracious and merciful and loving God, but this time you have gone too far. <laughs> you really have gone too far, God. That's what he was saying. He's defiant. This is his prayer towards God. So the question today I'd like to ask us is, has God's grace sunk from our heads into our hearts? When you think of God's grace, does the thought of God's grace melt your heart? Does the thought of God's amazing grace, is it really amazing or is this at a cognitive level? Yeah, you know for a fact that at a cognitive level it's amazing, but it's not ravishing your heart, is it? Right? It's not ravishing Jonah's heart, certainly. So what triggers in your uh, anger in your daily life, right? The question is not what makes us angry, but why do we burn inwardly with anger? Why do we boil? So, uh, how many of you know right now that uh, Mount Fuji is beautiful, magnificent, right? And uh, recently, uh, earlier this January, somewhere in February, sorry, uh, uh, did you know that the lava is showing, showing signs that is building up slowly inside? And Mount Fuji is ready to erupt anytime an earthquake triggers it, right? Some experts say that in March 2011, uh, when the triple disaster happened, it was uh, a fortune, uh, we were quite fortunate that uh, Mount Fuji did not erupt, they say. The experts, right? See, anger is like Mount Fuji volcano lava, right? Daily irritations and frustration starts to slowly build up and turn into burning anger, right? So, so sit situations arises in your workplace, in your homes, in your neighborhoods, and in, perhaps even in the train station. And they are ready to trigger the irritability and the frustrations, the anger that has been building up, right? It's just waiting to be triggered by small corrections, small offense, a snub, or feelings of rejection. This happens daily on social media in our day and age, in daily interactions at work, at home, and in universities. Even political ideologies or even values in life can make us contemptuous of others. Why? Because it's not because we are right or the others are wrong. It's because rightness has become a form of self-righteousness. Because something other than God is more important in our hearts functionally. That's why these angers come. Now, to be fair, in Jonah's context, an evil city like Nineveh should have been called, uh, called out, right? There were grave injustices in that city, as we saw in chapter 3. 
and God's judgment was pronounced by Jonah and uh, against Jonah's expectations, God had, God had shown mercy. See, but Jonah is not using the scriptures rightly, right? What Jonah should have done is teach about God's grace to repentant Nineveh. Now that they have repented, you teach grace. What Jonah should have done is taken the scriptures like Exodus and says, God is slow to anger, abounding in mercy. This is what he has shown you. No, that is not Jonah's response. Right? Something other than God's grace had failed Jonah. So he says, therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. This is what happens. For it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah lost all hope of living. Do you see this? Because God did not destroy the Assyrians who were a national threat to Israel. Jonah lost all purpose of living. He is depressed and disappointed because he even wanted to die because an idol, something other than God, had failed him. Because idols always disappoint you in the end. Idols are false gods. It can be any good thing, like in Jonah's case, his national identity. His patriotism turned into something that was unhealthy and extreme. Right? He wanted Israel's enemies destroyed. So God asked Jonah in verse 4, Do you do well to be angry? I love God, right? This is God who is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and mercy, comes and asks him this question. There is no rebuke yet. <laughs> He's asking him, Do you do well to be angry? He's reasoning with him as a father. Still at this point, God is so gracious, incredible, right? Do you do well to be angry? That Hebrew word angry means to burn hot with anger, to boil, literally. So here's a question again. How far do you think God should show grace to others? Let's pause for a moment. How far do you think God should show grace to others? Because it's very easy for me to say, God is gracious and merciful, but when our pride is hurt, offended, we become furious, withdraw our affections, and keep our distance from people. Do you see the grace deficit in our heart? However proficient grace is in our head, right? See, why do we do this? God's grace really need to sing from our heads into our hearts. Next we see the lesson of grace under the shade. Now God's going to teach grace. Jonah went, verse 5, out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a boot for himself there. He sat it, uh, under it uh, in the shade till he should see what should become of the city. Verse 6, Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, wow, that's short-lived, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun arose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And when he asked that he might die, he asked he might die and said, It is better for me to live than to uh, die than to live. But God said to Jonah the same question, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. If we could hear him, that's what he might have said. Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to, be, to die. Right? Notice how verse 5 says, Jonah went out of the city and sat of the east of the city and made a temporary shelter for himself. Instead of teaching Nineveh about God's grace, he went out of the city. Keep that language in mind because it's very important. He sat under it saying, uh, under the shade, till he could, should see what would become of the city. See, just, uh, pause with me quickly here. Jonah is like the elder brother in Luke chapter 15. Remember, the elder brother was angry and could not celebrate the younger son's return. He was outside. He didn't want to enter into the party in Luke 15. Here, uh, Jonah is behaving exactly like that. He went out of the city. He didn't want to come in, right, into the city. The elder bro brother was out of the party, didn't want to come. Father had to come and entreat him. See, Jonah didn't want the Assyrians to experience God's grace. Jonah wanted judgment. Jonah wanted justice. Jonah wanted destruction. Jonah wanted to sit on the hillside and watch God pour out his fury upon that city. So what does God do? 
Verse 6 says, Now the Lord appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. Do you see how gracious God is? God appoints a plan to save Jonah from his discomfort, this angry prophet. Earlier, God had mercifully appointed a fish to save Jonah, and now he appoints a plan to comfort angry Jonah, the angry, self-righteous, pharisaical prophet. See, God is a very patient teacher, and he has been patiently teaching you and me over these years all these years. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plan. Do you see this? For the first time, the angry prophet is smiling. Wow. But the smile was not because he's happy for others. <laughs> the smile was not because uh, uh, Nineveh had repented. The smile was because he was exceedingly glad because of the plan, because of the shade, the comfort that the plan brought him. Jonah is experiencing the comfort of God's blessing for a while. But verse 7 says, when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm to attack the plant, right? It takes a small worm to spoil your joy, right? It withered, it says. Why did God do this? See, listen up. If we make an idol of our comfort, if we turn comfort, God's blessing, into something like a God to give us the ultimate comfort, God will find a way to expose that. God is showing Jonah that he is the source of the comfort, not the plant. Right? A small worm took away Jonah's happiness and comfort that day. A small worm, a small thing can really trip up your joy if your joy is not rooted in God. If your comfort does not come ultimately in God, the very blessings that he has given you when it's taken away from you can take away your joy and your comfort. My goodness. So verse 8 says, When the sun rose, God appointed scorching east wind. It's not done. And the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint in the summer heat, right? That's a desert storm right there. Jonah is now without strength. He's fainting. He's weak. So that he was faint, it says. What is God showing Jonah? Only in weakness. Only when you come to the end of yourselves. When you no, no longer have strength to do the Christian life, to run from God, that God's grace is all we need. That's when you realize that's all that you really, really need. Only in weakness do we experience that God's grace is all we need. See, how do you feel when your comfort is taken away from you? It's painful, right? What is the source of your ultimate comfort? Because uh, in modern societies, we have everything. You know, uh, yet we are empty, we are fragile, we are easily upset when things don't go our way. See, only the God of the heavens, the seas and the dry land can give us true comfort. This is what God is teaching. God must be your all, above all else in your life. The plant, the warm, the hot wind, all came from God. When you realize that all, God is all you need, then you're really beginning to understand God's grace. When you realize that God is all you need, then you're beginning to understand God's grace. Has Jonah learned this lesson? No. Verse 8 says, He asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry <laughs> for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. Jonah is depressed. Right? He's exhausted, he's furious because his idols are shattered. His false gods are shattered. False gods always disappoint you. His selfish anger has been exposed under the heat of the sun. Right? God will use natural circumstances to expose the deep roots of our idols because of his mercy toward us. Just like the elder brother in the prodigal story, Jonah couldn't stand the free mercy of God for Nineveh. And so finally we see the grace, of, the grace God extends to outsiders. Verse 10, and Jonah, uh, the Lord said, sorry, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. What a humbling statement. Verse 11, and should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right from their left, right hand to the left, and also much cattle? Jonah actually did not pity the plant because the word pity in verse 10 has two Hebrew meanings, Hebrew word. 
It can mean to look upon with compassion or it can mean to look upon regret depending on the context. Here Jonah regretted that the plant died because his personal comfort, his safety, security and convenience are taken away. Wow. But in verse 11 God says, should I not pity? That word pity means to look upon with compassion. This is in keeping with God is slow to anger, full of grace and mercy, full of compassion, steadfast love and faithfulness, right? In other words, Jonah cares more about his comfort than the people of Nineveh. Does that sound familiar? God was saying, look at this great city, Jonah. Look at this great city of Nineveh. They do not know their right from their left is to say they are lost. They are sinners without me. Should I, shouldn't I have compassion on them? God was basically saying, you feel sorry for the plant that you gave you shade, Jonah. You didn't labor for it. You didn't make it grow. It came and it perished. I made it grow. I made the plant. I made the people. I made the cattle. I have compassion for this city, Jonah. Shouldn't I have compassion on the 120,000 people made in my image, whom I have created for my glory? Says in Isaiah. See, God had boundless compassion, not just for Jonah and the Israelites, because it's very easy to think that God has compassion only those who are gathered here as a church on Sundays. What about the countless people around us that we don't even take time to look at, right? Or get out of our comfort zones, right? God has boundless compassion, not just for Jonah and Israelites, but also for the pagan sailors in chapter 1 and the Ninevites in chapter 3. Right. Jonah's affections were distorted. Right? Jonah cared more for his personal comfort than for the spiritual destiny of thousands of people. Jonah cared right, more for his personal comfort than for the spiritual destiny of thousands of people. How about us today? God has compassion not just for us who are being saved in here, but also for the unsaved out there into the city. Will we remain strangers, outsiders in the city, or we will enter the city with compassion? Right? Shouldn't we have compassion for this city if salvation is by grace alone? Right? If I didn't contribute anything to my salvation, I have no reason to look down my nose on anyone. Right? Shouldn't we want others to receive this grace as well? That's their point. So, what do you expect a gardener to feel when a gardener takes great care of a plant and watches it grow, only to see it wither and die? God feels about Nineveh with greater compassion than a gardener. God feels about this city he looks upon the city with compassion. God was basically saying, Jonah, your anger, your discomfort and pain is nothing compared to mine. Should I have not mercy on people made in my image? Should I have not have compassion on sinners who are without me, perishing without me? How does Jonah respond? The final question is unanswered. Nothing is said about how Jonah responded to this last question. Clearly, Jonah forgot that though he deserved death for his disobedience in chapter 2, when he sunk into the deep waters down there, he was delivered by God. God had sent a fish. When Jonah read from God, uh, God sent a storm in chapter 1. When Jonah was drowning in the waters, God sent a great fish to rescue Jonah in chapter 3. It was all to show Jonah that God is full of grace and mercy, compassion and love. So, where do we see the greatest display of God's compassion. As we saw in the last three weeks, in Matthew 12, 40, 41, Jesus said this, look with me. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Something than Jonah, greater than Jonah is here, right here today. Jesus is greater than Jonah, who wept with compassion for the city of Jerusalem, Luke 19, 41. When he was headed towards Jerusalem, he wept for the city of Jerusalem. To the very city that was going to reject him. 
Unlike Jonah, Jesus was rejected and crucified outside the city for our sins. Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, but he was rescued. Jesus was buried under the waves of God's wrath for three days and three nights, right? yet it was for our sins. Jesus suffered God's wrath that we deserve in order that we might receive the grace we didn't deserve. But Jesus rose again to offer forgiveness to all who would believe in Him, to all who would come to Him. Right? Greater than Jonah is right here. Jesus lived the perfect life Jonah could not live. Jesus lived the perfect obedient life you and I could not live. Jesus was cast into the storm of God's judgment so that we would receive the mercy we didn't deserve. Let me say that again. Jonah was cast into the storm and rescued. Jesus was cast into the ultimate storm of God's judgment so that we would receive the grace and mercy we didn't deserve. Right? Jesus had a better resurrection than Jonah. Sorry. Jesus died a greater death than Jonah for our sins. Jesus had a better resurrection than Jonah to give us the resurrection we didn't deserve. This, this corrupted sinful body that is fading away will one day have will one day be incorruptible, never to taste corruption again, never to taste death again. God is gracious to you. He's tender in His affection to you, towards you. He's slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love toward you. Second Peter 3.9 captures this so beautifully. We'll close with this verse. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise at some count slowness, but is patient towards you not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. This was so beautiful to me this morning as I thought about this. Captivated me. Because it says the Lord is not slow. He's slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and mercy. But He's slow. He's not slow to fulfill His promise. His covenant, He keeps His word. He's a promise-keeping God. As some count slowness. Because some people say, where is His coming? Where is His second coming? No, the Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise as some count slowness, but His patience, divine patience towards you. Can you imagine with me for a moment the patience of God who lets the sun rise on the horizon this morning to a city that will not even lift up their eyes to Him. He has been enduring the nations for years and thousands of years. He has been enduring sinners who are blaspheming His name for years. He's slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and mercy, holding back His wrath against sinners because of Christ. So people will either face Christ on the cross, receive His mercy now, or they'll have to face the second coming where there will be no second chances anymore. Every tongue, every nation will render acknowledgement to His Lordship. They will bow before Him whether they like it or not. Kings and queens will bring their thrones before Him and surrender to Him. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you. Look, what an incredible God. Not wishing that any should perish, that is His very heart. Of compassion he's not wishing that any should perish that the offer of the gospel should go to everyone that his grace should reach out to everyone that no sinner no cruel sinner no horrible terrorist is beyond the reach of God's lavish grace not wishing that any should perish perish but that all should reach repentance he wants them to come to repentance his compassion his goodness leads us to repentance god is patient toward you today not wishing that you should perish god poured out his wrath on jesus for our rebellion he treats us not according to what we deserve but according to his grace it caused god his son to relent from disasters towards us it caused Jesus' life to rescue us from sin's destruction. God's de God desires that you come, you and I come, to repentance today. Repentance is a lifestyle. So what should be our attitude towards the city? Not one of self-righteousness, not one of contempt, certainly. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was once lost. <laughs> And now grace has found me. 
if that is really sweet, there is no room for a contemptuous spirit. The grace of God melts our hearts. His compassion becomes our compassion. He wants us to see this city with, our, with His eyes, with the eyes of compassion. To show compassion as Jesus does, it will cost us tears. It will cost us time. It will cost us heartaches. It will cause us pain. Love is costly. As C.S. Lewis said, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love that is self-protective is in love at all. To love people is to open up your heart. Jesus did not merely tolerate us. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you, says Romans. Well, how did Jesus welcome us? He opened up his heart. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. He opened up his very heart in selfless pouring out of himself. It'll cause us heartaches. It'll cause us pain. It'll cause us energy. It'll cause us resources to reach others who are far from us far from Jesus, outside of our cozy comforts. Love does not, is not self-protective. That's what Jesus did for you. Jesus went so far as to pour himself out completely. So if you care about people, cities are full of people made in his image, made in God's image. They are worthy of your time, your respect, your love. They are worthy of your resources because Jesus gave his life for them. More than half of the world's population are living in urban areas now. God has put us in Tokyo, a major global strategic city, to reach our friends and families and share His gospel of grace with them. You have the resources. Jesus is your resource. He has everything you need. He is all you need. God has put us in Tokyo, really, to reach our friends, our families, share His gospel of grace with them. Grace extends to the church. He wants us to show the grace of Christ in our homes, neighborhoods, and workplaces. That means when people are gossiping and you remain silent, instead of slandering, you shine the light of Christ, the aroma of Christ. Light exposes darkness. When there is injustice, as we saw in chapter 3, you call out in gentleness, in truthfulness, in graciousness. Do you see this? Because God has shown His justice towards you, right? God's justice came upon Jesus. He took the judgment for the penalty for our sins in order that we might receive the grace we didn't deserve. We'll show grace to others instead of treating them according to what they deserve. He wants us to go into our neighborhoods, our homes, our workplaces. Right? I get encouraged when people tell me, Hey, Pastor Joey, I was talking to my friend over the counter. Wow, what a great conversation that you took time to stop that you took time to look around you and see that Obachan who helps a needing hand. And she asked you, where are you going? And you said, I'm going to church. That's all you need. One, th one time I was in Nagoya on the way to Christ Bible Seminary. Nobody knew. I was there at the station. Somebody was being brought in a wheelchair. Couldn't get to the taxi. Taxi door was open. So I helped along. It's very natural. No show, nothing glamorous. Ordinary Christianity. Helped her, helped the wheelchair up, put it in the back of the car. The lady went back into the taxi. It was my taxi. Then she went. The next taxi came and I took, and the drivers that started telling me, hey, what you did there was good. Where are you going? I said, I'm going to Christ Bible Seminary. <laughs> I was so excited to say, Christ. <sighs> I was so excited. I didn't need to say anything anymore. I just said, Christ Bible Seminary. And in my heart, I'm praying, Oh Lord, would He make the connection? Would He make the wonderful, glorious connection in the power of Your Spirit that He will see that it was for the sake of Jesus, that He will see Jesus and not me? That is the way it works. So I leave you with three simple things. Initiate a conversation. Listen with compassion. Share the grace you've been given. Let Jesus do the saving. He is very good at it. Would you stand as we close in prayer?